Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Romance is a Many Splendored Thing Fantasy Edition panel for New York Comic Con 2020. Uh, my name is Carly Lane. I'm the contributing editor over at Sci Fi Fangirls, and I'm honestly really excited to be talking with some phenomenal authors about writing fantasy and the elements of romance that exist at the heart of the epic worlds that they have created. Um, I'm joined by such an esteemed panel and I'm going to let them introduce themselves in their own words since we know that they're wonderful writers. Um, but I will start with uh, Holly. Hi, I'm Holly Black. Um... I write contemporary fantasy for kids and teens. And uh, my most recent book is How the King of Elfheim Learned to Hate Stories. It's a novella set in the Book of the Air universe and it's coming out on November 24th. Roseanne, how about you? Uh, my name is Roseanne A. Brown and my most recent book is A Song of Rapes and Ruin, which is set in a world inspired by West African folklore and follow two teens who have to kill each other to save their families, but then how their plans kind of get derailed when they finally meet and they realize they have a lot more in common than their enemies want them to know. Sounds so good. Also, I have to just say congratulations on getting the option for TV. That's super exciting. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, TJ. Hi, I'm TJ Kloon. I'm the author of the recent, recently released The House in the Cerulean Sea from Tor, The Extraordinaries, my first YA book from Tor Teen. And next March, I have my next book with Tor, Under the Whispering Door, a queer romantic fantasy about ghosts in a tea shop. Chloe. Hi, I'm Chloe Neal. I'm the author of a whole bunch of books, mostly urban fantasy. And my next release is actually historical fantasy. It's called The Bright and Breaking Sea and it will be released on November 17th. It's Pride and Prejudice plus Vaster and Commander plus Magic. So it's um, kind of an alternative Regency London with a lot of magic and some very beautiful tall ships. Literally every book is like 100% my thing right now. Like all of them so far. <laughs> um, Lillian? Hi, I'm Lillian Rivera and I am an author of young adult books, middle grade, uh, graphic novels and my new book new young adult book that came out last week is uh, called never look back and it's a retelling of the uh the greek myth orpheus and eurydice and it's set in mostly in the bronx and um yeah it just came out and um, i'm really super excited to be here <laughs> and of course last saba Hi, my name is Sama Tahir, and I'm the author of YA high fantasy books, a series called An Ember in the Ashes. My most recent book is actually a graphic novel that was out in July from Boom Studios. It's called uh, Feast Beyond the Trees, um, and it's sort of a prequel to the Ember books. And then my, I guess, the book that's coming out next is Sky Beyond the Storm, and that'll be out December 1st, and that is the fourth book in the series, and the series has taken me 13 years, so it's very cathartic. So exciting. I honestly, every single book that everyone just talked about, I'm like, okay, TBR list. We're going to just check this off right now. Um, I feel like I want to start with kind of an open-ended question that a lot of people usually talk about. What was your gateway to the fantasy genre? Like, was there a specific author or series that you stumbled upon at the right time in your life? And you were like, this is the book. This is the author. My life is never going to be the same. I'm a fantasy fan. Yeah, I'll go ahead and go. Uh, for me, it was especially when I was a kid, I used to read a lot of uh, horror and, and mysteries and thriller. I didn't read a whole lot of fantasy until I got my hands on Howl's Moving Castle by Diane Wynne-Jones. And after that, I went on to the Dale Mark series that she'd written as well. And to this day, I can still read those books over and over and over again. And from there, it led me to finding Anne McCaffrey's Dragon Riders of Pern, especially the big omnibus edition with the first three books that was like 900 pages long. And I loved every single second of it. The first fantasy I remember reading or seeing was Thundar the Barbarian, if anybody remembers that. The comic or the TV show from the, I think, early 80s. It was very bad Saturday morning cartoon, um, but it was set in a fantasy world. And there was these big, chunky horses that I thought were just awesome. Um, so that was kind of my first fantasy element. Um, and I read, I think when I was in the seventh or eighth grade, I read the Xanth books. 
um, obsessively because I love a pun and those are the punniest books possible. Um, and I, that also, that it wasn't just a world that had been created, but a series where you got to learn about characters and how they grew and developed over time. So you kind of squish those things together and that's what I, that's what I love to write. There's a Sorry. No, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, when I was a kid, I was a big high fantasy reader. I think I started with Lloyd Alexander um, and, you know, his series, the best known of which is probably The Black Cauldron. And then I read a lot of Tolkien. And also I subscribed to the science fiction book club, which would send you a book if you forgot to tell them not to. I was a very <laughs> absent-minded child. So I went up reading a lot of stuff, um, and that's what got me to read uh, Tanith Lee, a British fantasy author, which is probably my, one of my biggest inspirations. Um, I guess for me, a lot of my introduction with fantasy wasn't actually books, but actually through folk tales. My family's from Ghana, so we do, there's a lot of oral storytelling in the culture. And so a lot of this has been passed down. Anansi is probably the most well-known, but there's just a whole sort of just this big canon of stories that could pass down to pass on the culture and the history and they have so many fantastical elements to them and so that was kind of my introduction but like in the more sort of like traditional book sense I think the book that really made me like oh my god fantasy I think it was um The False Prince by Jennifer Nielsen and just I remember like being in high school and just going to that book I'm like oh my gosh oh my like my brain was just broken I was like I, ne I need to do something that makes someone feel the way this book made me feel. Mm -hmm. I love, I love that you say that because that's just definitely the way I found out about fantasy was through folk tales, through uh, mostly from Puerto Rico and Caribbean kind of folk tales. So that's really where I got any of my fantasy kind of uh, upbringing. But I did read um, The Hobbit when I was really young and I was just like, you know, this, you know, I'm from the Bronx, New York, and um, I was just like, I don't, what is happening? But I was in it. <laughs> I was like really <laughs> in it. So yeah, so that was like really my first uh, little taste into the fantasy world. <laughs> yeah, my experience is very similar to Roseanne's and um, uh, Lilliam's um, stories that my mom told me when I was little about jinn um, and Efreets and monsters. Those That was sort of my, my biggest um, inspiration, my first introduction to fantasy, um, but a more sort of traditional um, Western um, fantasy that I read that actually help me connect the two worlds was um, The Sword of Shannara by Terry Brooks. I read it as an 11 year old and at the time I was in middle school and we all know middle school was awful <laughs> so it was my escape and um, it really helped me kind of um, uh, appreciate fantasy and and I started sort of connecting those two worlds after that um, but I I ended up reading like the whole Shannara series like within you know a like three months or something. So it definitely got me hooked onto epic fantasy. I love that you guys keep coming back to the worlds that we lose ourselves in. Cause I feel like that's something when somebody thinks fantasy, that's honestly the first thing is like the world building, right? What's the universe that we is crafted for us that's so immersive. Um, and I'm curious just from a writing standpoint, when you're working on a story what aspect comes first? Do you create the characters and then kind of say, well, what world are they going to inhabit? What, what are the rules here? Or do you develop the world first and then establish the characters that would exist in it? I tend to focus on the characters usually always first. It doesn't matter what kind of story I'm writing, but um, usually if I'm coming up with an idea, there's always going to be a character there speaking in my head in the background and, and making themselves known. And they're the ones that I tend to put the focus on first and, and I kind of create the world around them as opposed to creating the world for them because I want them to be reactionary as to what I'm building for them. But for me, it's always going to be character first. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I'm also a character first writer. Um, and then I tend to build the world by iteration. Um, so it's very sort of broad strokes in that first draft. And then, you know, I get deeper into the details of the world as I go on. Yeah. That's definitely, that's, yeah, that's definitely me. It's just characters first. But it always comes like a, an image of a character doing something. So it's for Never Look Back, you know, um, I always had Yuri, who's, um, she's Afro-Latina. She's coming in from Puerto Rico. So I always imagine her with her headphones on and in a car just coming from the airport 
and landing and you know landing and heading towards the Bronx. So that was the first image, and I was like, oh, what's going on? What's happening? You know. So that's really the way I I think about characters. It's always this one image that pops up, and then I'm just curious as to where their journey is gonna end up. So. Yeah, same. I'm My Oh, sorry, Rebecca, or Rosie, go ahead. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I just want to say I'm similar to Lilium in that I tend to have a situation first. So it'll be characters, but like they need to be doing something. Because if I just start characters, I'll end up with like 40,000 words of them like eating breakfast. And I'm just like, ooh, no one wants to read this. But like with race specific situation that kind of came to mind was I was thinking a lot about sort of mental illness and magic and how they're substitutes for each other in fantasy. And I was like, thinking about possession. I was like, what happens if a mentally ill person gets possessed by a ghost? And that just sort of became the catalyst for my main character in race. And so I tend to need like a situation, kind of like a question that needs answering. And then the story kind of snowballs from there. I have cut out more than one scene involving 20,000 words of people eating breakfast. So I totally, <laughs> totally get that. It's cute, but not necessary is a comment I get not infrequently. Um, I'm really visual. So I tend to like, I have a big saved file of Instagram pictures. I have Pinterest boards and I tend to see a thing or a landscape or something I want to know more about. So for me, it kind of starts with that like I, I am fascinated by tall ships and I thought, man, let's do something with tall ships. And I saw, you know, there's pictures of Iceland everywhere and there it's just this amazing landscape and it looks really magical and kind of fantasy-ish just on its own. Um, so I think about putting those th two things together and then I think, okay, who's the character who do I want to drop into this world on this ship with problems and have to deal with them? Um, and so the character kind of comes out of that what's the what's the nexus what's the thing in the core that i want to write about and think about for the next two years i think the thing that's really interesting too is of all these fantasy worlds you get to create kind of your own rules right like you get to decide this is how things are going to go here but then i feel like also in in coming up with these fantastical realms there's things that can even kind of surprise you when you're crafting the story. So was there anything that surprised you the most about the world building process in terms of like creating those inverse unit, like rules and laws, um, something that cropped up, like maybe you had set out to establish a system in a certain way and then something else kind of, a character made a decision that kind of took you by surprise. Yeah, for me, it's I, it's finding out how easy it is to break my own damn rules. <laughs> and, and sometimes you don't even know you're breaking your own rules until you're finished with the book and like a beta reader or an editor is reading the book and they're like, okay, well, this kind of doesn't work for reasons that you made up. So it's kind of your fault and you need to go back in and fix this. And, and you don't even know it when you're looking at the book in the first place. You don't even see that you've broken your own rule. For me, Sometimes what happens is I'll be writing and I have my rules, my rule sheet, my list. And I'll think, you know, it'd be really cool. And that is always the death of me because I always think that. And then I'm always like, uh oh, I'm about to do something I probably shouldn't. And it always comes back to bite me in the butt later on down the road. But for me, it's always about how easy it is to break my own rules. I think um, when I started thinking about making up fantasy worlds, what I thought is these need to be internally cohesive. But what I didn't realize is they also need to be thematically cohesive. And that thematic business has to have something to do with the story I want to tell. And beyond that, they actually have to be story generative. And like having, I'm just right now wearing, working on some world building and there were like these fun pieces of business that seemed like they were um, smart and interesting, but they weren't story generative. And, you know, I had to rethink everything when I was sort of thinking, is this thematically consistent? Does this like create opportunities for me to tell more stories in this world? Um, I think because I was working on a structure, it was, you know, it was the Greek myth Orpheus and Eurydice. And so everyone knows it's a classic, it's a tragic tale. And so then that was my structure that I used to create this, this world, right? Never look back. But I always knew that I was going to write about what it looks, what it means to be an Afro Latino um, person, you know, young person, and um, and all those things that are tied to to that history of colonialism and imperialism and all that stuff tied to the history of the Caribbean islands. And so then I was really thinking of 
the horrors that are in place um, now <laughs> and in the past. So it was kind of fun to really just, you know, this fantasy world, um, just really dig into what is scary in, in the things that I grew up, like learning from my family, you know, scary, scary tales, folk tales, but also just sort of push, push on and just kind of create something new. Um, and, and, and still be within that, that structure of the Greek myth, you know? So it was just like, you know, looking at a classic, but just sort of flipping it as well. So that was what I loved. I loved that part. I loved going into the, you know, the scary underworld. I was like, let's just keep staying in there <laughs> and see what else scary shit, you know, scary stuff that comes up, you know? So <laughs> sorry, no, no cursing. <laughs> So I didn't, I didn't several of my it. book series. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. Sava, go ahead. Oh, you're all good. Okay. Uh, several of my book series are set in Chicago. Uh, Chicago Land Vampires, Heirs of Chicago Land. Um, there's a couple others, and they're modern day urban fantasy. So one of the interesting things for me was to figure out how to use really a pre-existing setting, but build a layer of magic and fantasy into it that made sense. Um, I've read, you know, there's a lot of other urban fantasy series and a lot of them are set in big cities. And it was fun for me as a, just as a reader to think about, oh, you know, I've been in New York. I know the Empire State Building. I didn't know its magical purpose was something or other. Um, so I try to give readers, especially readers who are familiar with the city, those little moments where something that they knew existed in the mundane world actually has a property that they didn't know about. Um, and that means I get to spend a lot of time on, you know, Google street maps and trying to learn about strange little, um, intricate details of Chicago, which has been a lot of fun. Um, so I, I didn't expect that magic would be so awful at solving problems in books. So like, as I was sort of creating the magical world in, in my books, I was kind of realizing it was really causing more, more difficulties than it was fixing. I actually think ultimately that's a good thing because that's, that's sort of how real life works, right? Like you think you get something really wonderful, whether it's, you know, money or power or what have you, and it comes with all these issues and, and problems. I think that's especially realistic for, for my characters, but I, I didn't realize that. And I didn't realize that there would need to be a balance between the two, between what you get from the sort of fantastical elements of the book, whether it's creatures, whether it's um, powers, and, and what's taken away from you as a character. Um, because of those things. And for me, I guess the biggest thing I learned with world building was the idea that even the world too can have an arc and like the, what is happening within the story, what's happening within the plot, the world itself and what it's moving toward and the way it's affecting it follows an arc as well. And so kind of following not just the beats of the stories, but the beats of how the world itself is moving, how it's being affected by the events and how it changes them and then thus changes the characters and they have this kind of like symbiotic relationship was definitely like a dance that I kind of had to learn and that I'm like having to relearn now with the sequel. But there's just idea that like sort of everything about the book is just kind of like informing every other thing. And it just never really stops moving. Even when the reader doesn't always see sort of the things happening on the back end, it's always, it's just always kind of moving. I feel like as a uh, self-professed romance lover and as a, well as a fantasy uh, reader, and because the panel is called Romance is a Many Splendor Thing, I have to ask the romance questions <laughs> now. Um, I, I know a lot of you have talked about, you know, characters first usually, and then we kind of think about like how the world around them is, is going to take shape. What was it about the romance specifically that kind of made you want to include that you know, in your stories? Is there something where when the characters started to take shape, you realized, oh, they have, there ha there's something going on between this character and another character, or did you go into it kind of wanting to include that element, or was, you know, what was, what was the reasoning? For me, because, it simply, oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> For me, simply, it'll always come back to the inclusion of queer characters in my books. Look, if you're, if you're outside of YA, uh, it can still be very, very hard to find good, accurate queer representation in, in books crafted by people who know what they're talking about. And to me, it's so, so important to continue to push that because, again, it's YA, young adult, is at the forefront of diversity, but science fiction and fantasy for the longest time uh, was a straight white man's game. 
and it's only it's only within the last couple of decades that that we've been able to push that uh, that notion aside and carve a space for ourselves, along with other marginalized voices that 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 need to be heard. And so for me, when I'm including a romance in my books, it is a queer romance, and it is a statement of the fact that that I, as a queer person in 2020, if I don't write my own happy endings, then I may have to leave it up to somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. So I always make sure that in my books, when there is a romance and it is between queer people, that I, I do my best to make sure that while it may not always be the focal point of the story, it is handled with care, it is handled with, with love and, and the, all the respect that I can do because we need, we need to lift up marginalized voices so we have characters, uh, marginalized characters actually have their moment in the sun. Um, oh, so I go ahead. <laughs> this is why we needed to get called on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So I guess I actually have something kind of embarrassing to admit, which is that my book actually originally wasn't a romance. Like even when it sold, it wasn't. But like everybody who read it was just like Malik and Karina. They both had different love interests. So it was like kind of romance subplots. But then everyone who read it, they were like, Rosie, are you are you sure this this isn't a romance? I was like, no, 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 it's not. They're like, are you sure? And y'all, they were right. I was wrong. I really, I'm big enough to admit that because I was really looking at the arc again and looking at through the visions. And I'm like, oh gosh, this is a romance arc. How did I miss this? And I think it kind of came down to sort of the emotional justice of the story and the idea that these two characters, no matter everything else that was happening, they were most sort of affecting each other and they were affecting everything that was sort of happening to each other. And I really started to think about how I had sort of laid those elements down without realizing it. And then when I started thinking more in the bigger themes of the story and the idea sort of writing with black characters and how few there are who get happily ever afters and romance plots in fantasy. And I was realizing like this, like I kind of subconsciously even put that in there. I'm like, this is the story I'm telling. Everybody else knew that, but I did not. So eventually I got on the train, but it definitely took a little while to get to that point and be like, oh, this is what the romance is doing. This is how it's serving the story. This, this is what it's about. Yeah, I had two, two sort of things I was thinking about as I wrote the romantic elements of the book. And the first was sort of the dark side of love, which is really where the, the, the villain's origin story begins, um, sort of what happens when you maybe love a little bit too much. Um, and then the other thing was this idea that these two characters who are from very different sides of you know, life um, would be drawn to each other because they both want the same thing, which is freedom. And that was, that was to me, it was like, I wanted them to be on the same level, um, but it was tricky because they were not on the same level in the world and very similar to our world. Um, I've always hated the concept of like master slave romances. Like mm -hmm. I, just, I find that very like, um, and so it was really important to me that um, they be on equal footing before their romance really blossoms into something. And so the romance doesn't really get going until the, the second book because that's when they're actually on equal footing and I felt like it was uh, reasonable and, and fair and it was the type of romance I wanted to put on the page um, and I wanted young readers to read about because it was it, there was more equality to it and more fairness. Also, I love love triangles so I 100% put one and my, it was like a love square. It was very convoluted. It was so much fun to put in the first book. <laughs> um, I, well, sorry. No, go. Go ahead. Go. no, no, no. <laughs> Ali, please go. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, okay. Uh, what I really like about um, writing, putting romances in books in general um, is that it's chaos, right? It's a disruption it makes people irrational. You know, you already have probably the worst thing that could be happening to your protagonist happening to them. And here is a way to make it worse. Um, I, you know, the thing I always think about love is that it's about seeing one another and seeing one another truly. Uh, but that only happens later on. At first, it's just, it's cutting against all other parts of the story and it's an opportunity to inject tension in places that otherwise there wouldn't be tension. You know, you see screenwriters a lot of times using romances, the rest periods. This is a mistake. This is a waste. <laughs> Romance is an opportunity to make everything worse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
I love that. Um, yeah, well, you know, it's an Orpheus it retelling. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> It's a, um, my book is an Orpheus retelling, so they have to fall in love. They, it's insta love. And also, I mean, and I knew this, right? But I needed, I was feeling really depressed and sad when I was writing about this book because it was Hurricane Maria had landed in Puerto Rico. It was affecting my family and I needed to write about it. And so I found a way through a young adult book, you know, and I found it through the structure of the Greek myth. So I, I was clinging, like I was clinging, like I needed to desperately for love to exist <laughs> and I needed for hope to exist. And so with, um, with Orpheus, you know, with my never look back, um, Fierce and Yudi, they fall in love and, and, and they have to travel to the underworld, you know, and their love has to like prevail somehow. And um, so it was great to write about it. I needed it, but it was really hard. Because, um, you know, I, I don't, I love to see love. Uh, you know, I needed to see Afro-Latino love <laughs> in, in a book. You know, it's rare. And so I, I needed it. And so I wrote it. <laughs> I love found family. Um, and I think that's a theme in a lot of my books. The romance is a, a central part of the books and a central part of the series. Um, so each series has a kind of, each book has an individual romance arc, but then the, the entire series also does. Um, but I, you know, the idea that um, the person who you are kind of meant, at least for my purposes as God of this world, to be with is not necessarily the person you think you should be with or the person who you think you understand or who understands you. Um, and I think there's a really, that's such an interesting thing to work out, to go from enemies to lovers, to figure out how we move past what we think about ourselves and what we think about other people to kind of get to the heart of it. Um, because that's, I think that's really how found family is made. Um, you find somebody um, who accepts you exactly for who you are, regardless of your issues, regardless of their issues. Um, but kind of getting over the hump to get there is like Holly said, that's the best part. I feel like we don't even have that much more time left and I'm a little bit sad about it. So um, I wanted to play a fun game with you guys, but I we don't have time to do every round. Um, I thought it would be fun to do a game of either or, uh, fantasy trope edition. So I'm going to do a choice of either or, and I will call on every on people <laughs> so you can give your answer. Wait, could you, why don't we do hands? Oh, that'll work. Okay. Then we could do it real fast. Show of hands. <laughs> Holly's, Holly's on it. <laughs> okay, we'll do we'll do lightning round. Uh, I've got I've got four. Um, first one is sworn enemies to lovers or bodyguard slash guardian. Ooh, that's so who so who picked sworn enemies to lovers? Always sworn enemies to lovers. <laughs> Always. And who's and who's going bodyguard guardian? <sighs> yeah. Split <laughs> <laughs> oh, right down the middle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I found it so weird how easy these were to do, though. I was troubled by how, like, how much I knew what my answers were. <laughs> <laughs> um, second one is Beauty and the Beast or Amnesia. So who picks Beauty and the Beast? Okay. I thought y'all were leaving me by myself there. I was like... <laughs> <laughs> and then who's an, who's an Amnesia choice? But, like, barely... Yeah. <laughs> so, that doesn't count <laughs> like barely <laughs> i've written beauty and the beast twice so i have to pick it <laughs> um, okay. Okay. Beauty and the beast. number three is character in disguise slash undercover or fake relationship so who's I picking guys in disguise in disguise all the way fake and relationship is my evil <laughs> No, I like using a relationship, but with a fake element to kind of trick somebody else. Yeah, but only just as this, only as an element, not the whole plot, because that would drive me crazy. I, I just love when they're like, we're not gonna fall in love, but then they fall in love, like yeah. every time. <laughs> every, every time. <laughs> you, know, you know what's gonna happen. <laughs> okay, last one. Uh, the chosen one or the secret royal. So like a secret prince, secret heir. The you chosen know. one, because it's going to be the Matrix, but I want it to be a Latino. <laughs> <laughs> we don't get to be chosen ones. So chosen one, but with brown people. Yes. And queer people. Yes. And queer people yes. chosen yes. ones, too. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So you, you can make the same argument for secretly royal to marginalized people I don't agree. that either. We don't. Yeah. In fact, I just read a book exactly like that, and I'm secret royal too. Secret royal. <laughs> See, but you have to tell us which book, Holly. If you... <laughs> oh no, I cannot remember it. I cannot remember the title. They were in space, though. They were space princes. Oh. oh. That sounds amazing. It was really good. Oh, was it Bonds of Brass or? It was. Or, yeah. <laughs> I, got, I, know, I know space gays, okay? I know all about space gays. We're totally good. I was not going to call way. that up, Carly, if anything. I mean, we might have to stop on I know space gays. I was really about to say on that note, that's all the time we actually have. Um, and I just want to say a quick thank you to each and every one of our panelists. This discussion was so much fun. You guys are incredible. Um, everyone needs to go out, buy their books, treat yourself to these worlds. You will not regret it. Um, thank you to Read Pop. I also want to say a quick thank you to Creating Conversations for facilitating all this, for wrangling us all together. Um, and uh, thank you guys for watching at home. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>